Thomas Robbins was born in 1943 and was an undergraduate at Harvard before earning his PhD in sociology for UNC Chapel Hill in 1973. Throughout his career at the New School and Queens College in New York, Yale University, and the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, where he co-wrote this article, Robbins studied religious controversies. He wrote about agitation against Catholic and Mormon minorities in the 1800s, and eventually this research on new religious movements in the late 20th century. He died in 2015. Dick Anthony worked with Robbins at the GTU in Berkeley. He describes himself as a forensic psychologist, but his PhD from the GTU is in theology, not in psychology. He has not pursued an academic career, but has been active as a consultant and writer. This article, published in 1982, began a long-term collaboration with Robbins that led eventually to publication of the book In Gods We Trust about new religious movements. Robbins and Anthony have been engaged for several decades in a running battle with other social scientists and opponents of religious cults, sometimes leading to actual lawsuits against them, which are usually dismissed or which they win. Like Eileen Barker, they oppose the idea of brainwashing as unscientific and propose a more objective study of new religious movements. No pictures of either of these guys could be located. If you ever find them, please let me know. Sudden religious conversions in adulthood usually exploit disruptions in a person's existing social networks. To sustain and reinforce such conversions, those old social networks often come under attack by the new religious group that gained the convert. This article by Robbins and Anthony deals with the fact that when such conversions happen, that previously existing social network does not always take the sudden change lying down. If you abandon your friends and family, they may be upset and fight to get you back, to undo your conversion. To reclaim someone and get them to reverse a religious conversion, to get them back into their old familiar social network setting, friends and family members turn to a larger societal framework for support. The shape or content of this framework can vary from one place or historical period to another, but always includes some kind of basic rules or standards about the right and wrong ways to live. If the people from your old social network can use that basic foundation of right and wrong to paint your new religious group as wrong, they gain a powerful tool for getting you back. But we need to look more closely at this business of right and wrong. Robinson Anthony mentioned that there has been a shift in the way we define this problem. If you go back far enough into the past, when the position of organized religion in daily life was much stronger than today, the question was simple. The dominant religion defined right and wrong as a question of good versus evil. If you didn't follow their rules, then you were committing a sin. You probably would go to hell. All right-thinking, right-acting believers would either shun you or punish you. So if a new religious group comes along with a new message, the dominant religion brands them as evil sinners to be reclaimed or destroyed. The dominant religion takes care of any problems of such groups trying to convert your friends and relatives. Over time, though, this good versus evil picture has tended to shift. Different versions of the good versus evil picture might be painted by different religious groups, especially when we deliberately separate state power from religious beliefs. Catholics are not allowed to burn Baptists at the stake for heresy today, the way that Jan Hus was burned in Prague centuries ago. Instead of defining a social problem as a sin, we begin to think of it as a crime instead. Thou shalt not steal becomes a legal statute against burglary or strong-armed robbery. The social agency that deals with violations shifts from the clergy to the police. If your crime is serious enough, some societies still may take your life, but they typically do it now by lethal injection and court order, rather than by burning you at the stake in the nearest city park. This is not the end of the story, either. Moving in with your girlfriend or boyfriend, sleeping together without being married, used to be the crime of fornication, for which you could be arrested and thrown in jail. In some countries, it is still a crime to have an intimate relationship with another person of the same sex. But in other societies, this is just regarded as deviance, 
and in some places is moving towards being considered acceptable behavior that doesn't break any rules at all. There are many attitudes and behaviors that most people still don't like, but that are no longer crimes. They have become what we call deviance instead. Enforcement of standards about such things is left up to the court of public opinion. But there's one more stop on this journey, the stop that Robinson Anthony called medicalization. This brand of dealing with right and wrong seems to be expanding rapidly all around us today, swallowing up more and more of what used to be called deviance or crime or even sin, and instead defining it as sickness or illness. As soon as you redefine a social problem as a form of illness, the agency we expect to take care of it also shifts from the church or the police or just public opinion to medical professionals. So today, when your friends and relatives seek to rescue you from a religious cult, increasingly they are turning to medical professionals who can define your religious conversion as mental illness. Once that is done, you have to accept that you're sick and that you need treatment, which means leaving the cult you have joined. But we need to take a very close look at what we mean by normal here and recognize at least three quite distinct meanings of that word. Some things can be statistically normal, such as people of average height and weight. People who don't fit this average are not normal in this sense. They are unusual or statistically rare, such as a dwarf like Peter Dinklage in Game of Thrones or Andre the Giant in A Princess Bride. On the other hand, some people may choose alternatives to socially normal clothing or hairstyles. Most people do not dye their hair bright blue or red or green, but when some people do, this is not only statistically rare, but also viewed by many other people as socially deviant. Being statistically rare or socially deviant do not automatically mean that you are also not normal medically, that you're sick or damaged and in need of repair. These are three separate and distinct meanings of the word normal. Yet if we don't insist on careful thinking, it can be all too easy to slip back and forth between these different uses of the word normal and to begin treating people who are not normal in one sense as also not being normal in other senses as well. And if the medicalization of all of our social problems continues, we may find that everything that is statistically or socially different from normal also becomes defined as sick and in need of professional medical treatment. That's good if you make your living as a doctor of some kind, because the demand for your services expands toward including everybody in the world, but maybe not that great for the rest of us. The compass points in contemporary society to tell the difference between good and bad are shifting. When we don't like something, instead of branding it as a sin or arresting the culprit as a criminal, increasingly we define it as some kind of sickness. The reason for this shift is simple. All around us, we live with a growing army of helping professionals who depend on an ever-growing supply of sick patients who need to be helped. You may even become one of these helping professionals yourself, in which case your success and prosperity depend on the existence of these sick patients and also on public support for you to get paid for helping them. This growing army works very hard to define more and more things that are not normal in a statistical or social sense, as also not normal in a physiological or psychological sense, in other words, as sick. In particular, we are concerned here with applying this medicalization model of good and bad to the specific event of a religious conversion. It has been fairly simple for the helping professions to define many new kinds of problems like restless leg syndrome or attention deficit disorder as medical conditions requiring therapy and drugs. It is particularly easy to impose such definitions on relatively powerless people, such as children and the elderly. Matilda Riley once observed that the way we define old age is basically enforced deviance anyway. The way we expect and insist that old people should behave would be considered deviant in early adulthood. But when we turn the medicalization spotlight on physically healthy young adults, and when the problem is not in the classroom but involves religion, we suddenly run into obstacles. Particularly in the United States, freedom of religion is actually the very first thing mentioned in the Bill of Rights, even before the right to have our guns. 
were not allowed to make a law prohibiting the free exercise of religion. And when the Moonies invite you to go with them to their ranch, and you go along with it and eat the peanut butter sandwiches, don't you have a right to get on the bus? Don't you have a right to walk away from a previous life, a web of social connections, and strike out in a new direction? Aren't you free to choose your own religion? This is the dilemma faced by parents and friends when someone does undergo a sudden religious conversion, usually as a young adult who may be away from home for the first time, but also sometimes at other points in life, such as after a divorce, or after leaving military service, or after losing a job you've had for a long time. This is not just dyeing your hair green or becoming a vegan. This is about religious freedom, an electrified third rail in the Constitution of the United States. What's a helping professional to do in this situation? The answer that families have developed turns on this very same issue of freedom. It turns out that you can only exercise your basic freedoms if you have free will, the capacity to make informed choices for yourself. This may just sound like double talk at first, but it is not. The argument advanced by professional deprogrammers who have been hired by some parents literally to kidnap young adults who have joined a religious cult is that the psychological manipulations of the cult leaders have taken away the young person's free will, brainwashed them so they can't think properly or make truly free choices. We won't go into the problem of whether this was also what Sunday school was all about, but the brainwashing argument goes right to the heart of an important insight. People can be strongly influenced by the other people around them. This was true when these people were little children being shaped by their parents at home. It is also true when they fall in with a cult and start eating the peanut butter sandwiches. The point is that the first of these kinds of social control, parents bringing up their children and teaching them proper values and behavior, gets defined as good. The second kind of social control, manipulating people whose personal networks have been disrupted and drawing them into a new religious groups, gets defined as bad. In our new medicalization approach to problems, we decide that they are exhibiting a form of mental illness and are in need of treatment. This raises a fascinating and important question. Who gets to define what is normal and good? Whoever it is, they also get to define what is bad and sick, since these are just the other sides of the same coins. In contemporary American society, the new religious cults frequently get defined as bad. On this point, parents and leaders of established religions and the army of helping professionals that they bring into the battle all agree. We had to kidnap our son or daughter. They had already been kidnapped once by the cult, and we were just rescuing them. It was the lesser of two evils. The helping professionals contribute to this interpretation by citing the medical decision rule, that a medical operation is justified even when it is dangerous and likely to lead to permanent damage if it is done to prevent even greater harm. On Civil War battlefields in the 1860s, surgeons had to saw off many a wounded arm and leg in order to prevent the death of the soldier from gangrene poisoning in the wound. Converts to cults can fall under the same decision rule if the prospective damage of life in the cult is judged to be a big enough threat. So how do you deprogram somebody who has started eating the peanut butter sandwiches? How do you bring them back to their old normal network of social ties and activities? The answer, increasingly refined by experienced helping professionals, usually involves methods very similar to the recruiting approach used by the cult itself. First, cut off all contact with the members of the cult, perhaps by physically removing the person from the cult setting and forcibly isolating them in a motel in Bakersfield or somewhere. Second, confront the person with all kinds of evidence of how the cult really operates, the often lavish lifestyle of its leaders while the rank and file are living austere lives of sacrifice, documented incidents of suicide by cult members who couldn't get away, and so on. And just as these mind control techniques once worked for the group in recruiting the subject, they can work again to turn the subject against the group. Of course, there's no real guarantee that the rescued person's life will then become all hearts and flowers, filled with love and success, but at least they're out of the cult. Robinson and Anthony have some reservations about this whole operation, but they can't deny that it can be very effective 
at least in the short term. Almost by definition, any new religious movement starts at a huge disadvantage compared to established religions around it and to the larger context of standards in society. Except perhaps in societies like the United States, which encourages a kind of competitive marketplace of religious ideas, most new religious movements must be doomed to fail. This brings up a little secret about religious cults in America that neither the cults themselves nor their enemies who want to recapture and deprogram their converts want to admit. The turnover rate of membership in most of these movements is actually very high. The group takes pride in reporting its success in gaining new converts, the same process that fills its opponents with fear and hostility. But the group also tries to cover up just how many of these converts look around inside for a while, get disillusioned, and bail out again, often fairly quickly after joining. This makes the group look bad because people are not finding the answers they claim, and also because this means the membership numbers they report must be grossly overstated. Their opponents also don't talk much about these defections, because if lots of people are leaving the group anyway, what need is there really for all those helping professionals and their fancy deprogramming methods? So both sides may be overstating the appeal and effectiveness of the new religious movements. Robinson and Anthony also raise another issue about such conversions. While the accusations of brainwashing and mind control are troubling, they point out, there also may be positive results in the lives of some of these converts. For instance, new religious movements sometimes appear to be helpful in getting troubled people to cut back or give up using dangerous drugs, alcohol, and smoking. Converts may sometimes really be happier and more at peace than they were during the disruptions that make them open to joining in the first place. And after all, many established mainstream religious organizations also recruit new members, even sending mission teams all around the world on a regular basis to spread the good word about their faith. Where would Christianity be without the conversion of Paul on the road to Damascus? When the man who became known as the Buddha began to spread his message and attract the first Buddhist followers, they also constituted a new religious movement, a cult splitting off from the traditions of Hinduism. Were Jesus and his disciples a cult deviating from their Jewish heritage? The picture gets complicated. Of course, it is easy to identify some new religious movements as truly dangerous for their members, just so dangerous that the lesser of two evils idea and the medical decision rule clearly would justify removing members by force. Jim Jones and his People's Temple group from Oakland moved to the coast of South America to get away from their many critics, and in the end, there in the jungle, Jones and his assistants led the entire group into a mass suicide by drinking poisoned Kool-Aid. The Jonestown Massacre horrified the entire world. Should the group have been disbanded and deprogrammed? Many lives would have been saved. Should someone be kidnapping members of Al-Qaeda and deprogramming them? Again, many lives could be saved. Should Moonies be captured and deprogrammed? Here it is not a question of saving lives, and we drift back into the brainwashing controversy but it continues to happen. Where do we draw the line between good religions and bad or dangerous religious groups? For example, should Tom Cruise be kidnapped and deprogrammed to get him out of the Church of Scientology? Some critics claim that it is a dangerous cult. What about men and women who leave behind normal lives and families and isolate themselves in monasteries and convents, pledging to abandon the quest for material wealth and sometimes also the chance for marriages and children of their own. Only a small minority of people in American society would say that monasteries and convents are dangerous religious cults, but this life is certainly not normal in statistical terms or in terms of normal social conventions either. What about people who publicize their religious promises on television or the internet and ask strangers all over the world to send them money? Should they be admired as religious entrepreneurs or arrested as scam artists. The more you think about these distinctions, the harder it becomes to decide where to draw the line between good religion and dangerous brainwashing that cries out to be attacked and suppressed. In fact, each one of us probably would draw this line in a different place. 
Where does this leave the whole business of medicalization of society's problems and the role of the helping professionals? If you examine this situation closely, you may find that many psychologists, family counselors, and other helping professionals have fundamental beliefs of their own. And these beliefs sometimes have little or no room for organized religion. For example, Sigmund Freud, the father of psychiatry, felt that religion, quote, is so patently infantile, so foreign to reality, that to anyone with a friendly attitude to humanity, it is painful to think that the great majority of mortals will never be able to rise above this view of life, unquote. For Freud, as for many mental health professionals today, not only the new religious cults, but all of organized religion is basically an illusion, a nuisance at best, and a form of potentially dangerous mental illness at worst. One reason it may be hard to draw a line between good and bad religions may be that in our increasingly medicalized social universe, there may not be any such line at all. Will medicalization eventually swallow up all forms of abnormality as targets for the helping professionals to resolve? Will this process keep expanding, starting with the definition of normal as the opposite of sick, but gradually expanding so that the difference disappears between social deviance and illness? For example, monitoring pregnancies so that no unusual experiences might lead to babies who grow up with same-sex preferences? Will statistically rare outcomes like left-handedness or a taste for odd forms of music eventually require treatment by helping professionals? When that time comes, we may need so many of these helping professionals that nobody is left to grow our food or build our houses. Where will religion fit, if at all, in a totally medicalized society? Certainly I have no idea, but it's something for you to think about.